This is a BC Eagle Finance video. Brigham and Houston, Chapter 1, Overview of Finance. And the chapter will be fairly easy because it's a review of what you learned in Business 120, Survey of Business, and Accounting 1 and 2. This is an overview of what the textbook looks like. There are four sections that we will cover during Summer 1 in Fundamentals of Finance. The first section is an overview of financial management in exactly what the course does. And secondly, how it fits in the broader economy, specifically financial markets and some of the institutions. In chapters three through five, we will review what you learned in Principles of Accounting 1 and 2, the financial statements, income statement and balance sheet, cash flow, and a little bit about taxes. In the second part of this, chapter 4, we'll review what you learned in chapter 17 on the analysis of financial statements through the use of financial ratios. The ratios that we do here will look very familiar because they are the same ones that you did in accounting too. And finally, we will review time value of money. This will be the third time that you've seen this. Once in Principles of Economics, a second time when you reviewed Chapter 14 in Business 202 Accounting 2 when you talked about bonds. And now we will reinforce those same concepts in pretty much the same way in Chapter 5. Now, once we got those five basic chapters taken care of, we'll get into the true finance, uh, specifically with the financial assets. Financial assets represent those assets that represent the capital that goes to a business, bonds and stock. So we'll talk about rates of return and what investors want, bonds and their valuation, risk and rates of return that investors want for stock and then we will look at stock valuation. And finally in the last section we will take three chapters to review how to buy assets. Uh, that depends on the cost of capital or the cost of financing. Some tools that we use to indicate which asset might be a better one to buy and then finally adding a little bit of complexity with cash flow analysis. So let's get started. In chapter one uh, there's the introduction to finance, some of the jobs that are in finance, the forms of business organizations, an emphasis on creating value for investors, and two sets of conflicts that are natural and inherent in businesses. Conflicts between shareholders and managers and conflicts between stockholders and debt holders. These two groups, uh, stockholders and debt holders, represent the capital or cash sources for the business. And finally, we'll emphasize how these items are balanced in the real world. All right, for the introduction. What are the forms of business? The emphasis on creating value for investors, the two types of conflicts, shareholder and managers, and share stockholder and debt holders, and then how do you balance among these groups? First, how is a corporation organized? The typical corporation uh, has its owners that elects a board of directors. The board of directors is responsible for establishing the values and the vision of a particular corporation. The board of directors also hires the chief executive officer who is in charge of executing the marching orders from the board of directors. In our way of looking at a corporation, the executive officer has two main functions. One is to control the operating activities of the business, and usually the chief executive officer hires a chief operating officer to carry out that function. And the second function that the CEO has is to assure that the business has enough capital or funds coming into the business, and that's the realm of the chief financial officer. Underneath the chief operating officer are the functional areas of the business, the marketing, the production, 
human resources, and other operating part departments like uh, uh, information systems, like logistics, like the uh, supply chain. Under the chief financial officer, you'll have accounting, treasury, credit legal, capital budgeting, that's buying new assets, and investor relations. How was a business formed? In the United States, there are three main forms of business. You've heard about these in Business 120 Survey of Business. The first is a partnership. And as you know, a partnership, um, I'm sorry, a proprietorship. And as you know, a proprietorship has a single owner. That is the CEO, that is the finance officer, that does all the functional areas of the business. Though an advantage of being a sole proprietor is that the sole proprietor does not have to share any profits or losses with anything with anybody else. Everything that the business earns is the property of the sole proprietor. A disadvantage is that the proprietor is the sole source of capital funding. If the proprietor can't write a check to buy a new asset, the only recourse that the proprietor has is to take out a loan with the bank. Another downside with a proprietorship is there is unlimited liability, which means that the liabilities of the business become the personal liabilities of the liabilities of the business owner. On the good side, there are less legal formalities, there are not as many uh, paperwork requirements, and the owner does not have to answer to any other executive in the particular business organizations. The customers only dictate the owner's actions. In a partnership, all of the attributes of a proprietorship apply to the partnership with the exception that there is more than one partner involved. This particular course will emphasize the third form of organization, which is a corporation. And as you can see by the graphic, there is just more to a corporation. It exists as a separate legal entity, and there are very strict requirements on the use of funds and what the owners can do in relationship to the corporate form of organization. More on that later. So to review, the advantages of proprietorships and partnerships is that they are easy to form, they have fewer regulations, and they don't pay taxes themselves. They are known as pass-through entities, and the owners, the proprietor or the partners, pay the taxes on the profits that their entities earn. The disadvantage of the proprietorships and partnerships are that it's difficult to raise capital. They do not have sources of financing that's available to the corporation. The second item is that there is unlimited liability, meaning that the proprietor and the partners are jointly and severally liable for the liabilities of the business. And finally, proprietorships and partnerships have limited life. Their life extends only to the life of the owners. Once the owners either leave the business or pass on, the partnerships or proprietorships go with them. Often, proprietorships and partnerships for legal protection uh, are formed as LLCs, limited liability corporations, or limited liability partnerships. The benefit of using these forms of legal entities is that the owners do pay their own taxes, the entities work as paths through entities, but there is some protection for the personal assets of the owners for the corporate debts. Uh, it's a little bit tougher for creditors to get the owner's assets after they have exhausted all the business assets. For the corporation though, here is what you want to remember. Advantages would be an unlimited life. Officers can come and go, shareholders can come and go, and the business continues. The corporate entity is a separate legal entity apart from its managers and its owners. There's also easy transfer of ownership by the sale of shares of stock. 
When you buy a share of stock, you become an owner in a corporation, and selling those shares means that you pass title of that ownership to the next owner. There's also limited liability, which means that the liabilities of the corporation do not become personal liabilities of the individual shareholders. And, as the graphic indicates, raising capital is one of the strongest advantages of a corporate form of uh, entity. They can raise billions of dollars in the capital markets with this type of form of business. The downside, because the corporation is a separate legal entity, there is double taxation. Income earned by the corporation is taxed at the corporate level and then when the corporation distributes that income to the owners the owners pay tax a second time on that same income that is a strong disadvantage of the corporate form of business another disadvantage is that the paperwork is very very extensive for a corporation and the federal government and regulatory agencies demand that that paperwork be up to date so a lot of information systems technology is devoted to keeping up with the required reports now let's get to one of the main things that the course in finance tries to address and that is the value of what is being purchased now value can be distinguished from the stock price stock price is what investors are willing to pay for shares of stock but that varies over time a corporation should have its own true intrinsic value and that's what financial analysts try to determine to see whether the market price might be temporarily overstated or temporarily understated compared to the long-run intrinsic value of the corporation. In the short term, investors may be over-enthusiastic or overly pessimistic about future prospects of a business, and that creates opportunities in the market. If the market price is higher than the intrinsic value, investors will sell those shares until the intrinsic value is roughly equal to the market price. If the shares are underpriced, buyers will enter the market, drive up the price to about the intrinsic value. And so if investors will keep in mind what this long run intrinsic value is, they will be able to determine in rough fashion whether the stock would be underpriced or overpriced and act accordingly. Another way to look at intrinsic value is to have a wall that separates the intrinsic value from the stock market price. Market price is driven by perceptions of the shareholders for the cash flows that the company might earn and the risk of attaining those cash flows. Intrinsic value, on the other hand, represents the true investor cash flows and the true risk that the corporation experiences in attaining those cash flows. Now, the intrinsic value is a theoretical concept and is a long-run item to obtain, whereas the market price is a transactional item and is determined by the collective buying and selling of millions of investors in the open stock market. On the occasions when the market price equals the intrinsic value, economists and finance types say that the market is in equilibrium. Now, inherent in any particular business are conflicts, and there are two that we'll look at, shareholder-manager conflicts and shareholder and debtholder conflicts. As human beings, we are all driven to act in our own self-interest. Managers who work for a corporation would want to maximize the amount of income they get from the corporation. Oftentimes, bonuses are based on net income, and so managers will do all they can to maximize income in the short term to maximize their own income. But in doing so, well they may do some things like defer maintenance on important equipment, 
reduce expenses, you increase income. Uh, they may not hire all the people in the short term that's necessary to carry out the objectives of the business, reduce payroll expense, you increase income. So in the short run, there are ways to manage income to show that the company has more profit, which in turn gives a higher commission to the managers. The shareholders, though, who want to hold the stock for a long time, may not view that so favorably, especially if one quarter the company shows a lot of profit and the following quarter, when they have to hire more people and fix a lot of broken equipment, profits go down. So there's that natural conflict. So what's a shareholder to do in cases like that? Well, the first thing that shareholders can do is to develop managerial compensation packages that reflect long-term value of shares rather than net income. And oftentimes, uh, CEOs and other executives will receive compensation bonuses based on market price. A second thing that shareholders might do is to have direct intervention by buying blocks of shares of stock, hiring a new or electing a new board of directors member who will do the bidding for the shareholders. Oftentimes, when a new board of directors member comes in, uh, the CEO is under pressure to perform or be fired. Also, other businesses may swoop in when the stock price of a particular competitor is deemed as being undervalued. They will buy those cheap shares and then reorganize the business so that it will become more profitable in the future. So compensation packages, direct intervention by shareholders, and the threat of takeover by competitors are three ways managerial behavior is influenced in the open markets. Second conflict that you can run into would be the stockholder versus debt holder. Stockholders are known as residual interest parties, meaning that they get their share of income once all the other individuals have had their cut. For example, all the employees must be paid, all the bondholders must be paid, and after all of those folks are taken care of, stockholders get their share of the income pie. So shareholders would want to take on risky projects that have the potential to earn a lot of residual income for them. Bondholders, on the other hand, get a fixed payment in the form of interest. So the bondholders are very concerned about maintaining enough income to pay the interest. After that, they don't really care. So bondholders take a conservative approach. Shareholders, by their very nature, look for something that is a little bit more risky. So bondholders, in order to loan money to the corporation, will negotiate what's called protective covenants. Those covenants limit the action that business managers can take, such as taking on more debt so that the debt to equity ratio maintains itself at a relatively riskless level. Or they may also restrict managerial actions like affecting the amount of assets that the corporation can deal with, like uh, the corporation cannot factor its accounts receivable, sell them uh, and get cash because bondholders in the case of uh, a default or non-payment of interest might want to claim those accounts receivable for themselves so that they can get their interest payments. Same thing goes with new assets, plant, property, and equipment. The bondholders may restrict these new asset acquisitions if it entails borrowing new debt. And thirdly, to assure that there's enough cash for interest payments, the bondholders may restrict the amount of dividends that the corporation can pay. Specifically, dividends cannot be paid until the bondholders get all of their interest. So to review, stockholders like risk to get more income, bondholders are conservative so that they are assured of getting their fixed interest payments. Now, what about the shareholder and society? This course will emphasize that the primary focus of finance is to maximize shareholder wealth through increasing the stock price. However, 
what about the economic uh, actions of this shareholder wealth maximization? And what about the risk that the corporation might present to the economy or the environment by polluting rivers, by causing uh, too much um, pollution, or otherwise disregarding the environment itself? Well, here's the short story on all this. In the short term, it costs money to be a good corporate citizen. It costs money to abate pollution. It costs money to reclaim the land after drilling or mining operations. It costs money to assure that the products that the business is making are safe, reliable, and good for the humans that will consume them. However, in the long run, if the business does not attend to the long-run aspects of having an environment that will accept new businesses or if it uh, damages human life, well there won't be an earth that can sustain the corporation. So corporations increasingly have recognized that doing well also means doing good in the long-term economic as well as environmental sense. More on that will come later, but for right now, the takeaway is that social responsibility is something that the corporation builds into its profit projections in order to have long-term sustaining operations. Well, congratulations. You've completed Chapter 1. Thank you for listening.